people ask questions, there's a translation for you. What do I do with it? This book is on when, when people ask questions. Okay. So I'll, I'll be right here. Okay. But it's not okay. I'll be right here if you need anything. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm Rainey Reitman. I'm from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And as my friend just said, we are a nonprofit civil liberties law firm and advocacy based center based in San Francisco, California. I wanted to start off by telling the story of Khaled Mohammed Saeed. On June 6, 2010, Khaled Mohammed Saeed was sitting on the second floor of a computer cafe in Cairo, Egypt. He was a 28-year-old computer programmer who had studied in the United States. Saeed had published a video online that showed two Egyptian police officers sharing the spoils of a drug bust. On June 6, two plainclothes police officers entered the computer cafe where Saeed was working and arrested him. They tied his hands behind his back, and then they beat him until he died. The Egyptian police confiscated the mobile phones of everyone who was there, but word got out anyway. Photos of Saeed's bruised and beaten face began circulating around the internet, helping to stoke the frame flames of revolution. A Facebook page got started called We Are All Khaled Saeed, Thousands joined this page to express their outrage at the tragedy of his death. It became a source of community, of struggle, and shared vision, even though it was only a Facebook page. Well Golnim, a young employee of Google, co-founded that Facebook page and worked tirelessly to promote the revolution in Egypt. In speaking of his work to CNN, he said, if you want to liberate a society, just give them the internet. Unfortunately, it's not quite that easy. The internet alone cannot bring a revolution, much less create a functional democracy in a place that's been torn by civil unrest. And even as technology is used to connect and liberate people, others are using technology to surveil and censor and silence people. Less than a year after Saeed's death, Protesters stormed the Egyptian State Security Investigation, Ser Investigation Service, the SSIS, which has long been criticized by human rights organizations for the torture of detainees. The SSIS building in Cairo proved to be filled with evidence of not just torture, but also mass surveillance. Protesters found printouts of emails that had been intercepted, copies of text messages that had been intercepted, and they even found copies of Skype chats. Unfortunately, this type of surveillance of governments engaged in mass surveillance of our online communications is not new. There are so many examples of governments engaged in surveillance and censorship, of infiltrating our communications and preventing people from reaching the open web. And in many countries, including in many democracies, this surveillance is hidden from the public. Uh, it is particularly troublesome that the internet, which is supposed to be a powerful tool for transparency and for holding governments accountable to the, pe to the people, has been infiltrated in ways that facilitate this surveillance. Governments using technology to abuse human rights don't work alone. They work hand in hand with technology companies that create the very tools that these governments are using to intercept our messages and block access to the open web. Today, I'm going to talk about a range of abuses perpetrated through technology. And I'm also going to talk about how we can use technology to defend human rights. And then I'm going to draw a way forward, a way you can help defend the free and open internet, because it is only with your help, with the help of concerned and passionate individuals who understand technology, that we can possibly create a future where the internet is a place of free thought, free ideas, and free access to knowledge. But before I get started, I wanted to suggest two ideas, two concepts that I want you to consider as we walk through these things. And the first is that technology to improve, 
privacy, and circumvent censorship should be used by everyone, not just because it's a good idea to have privacy when you use the internet, and it certainly is, but because in doing so, we provide an additional shield for those who really need the help, journalists and activists and whistleblowers and others. We provide cover because we make it normal to be using these technologies to protect our privacy. And we can each become evangelists for using these tools, for ensuring that they are used by people everywhere. And the second idea I wanted to propose is that companies that control our online spaces have, make choices that have huge ramifications for our rights. How freely we can speak, how easily we can communicate, how much we can access information, how easy it is to preserve our privacy when we use the internet. All of these are the sum results of decisions. Many of them are small decisions made every day, whether by a corporate board of directors or just by an engineer working at a company. We have an opportunity now to call on companies to take an active role in defending a free and uncensored web, one that tolerates creativity and innovation and upholds privacy. I'm going to start talking through my examples uh, by beginning in New York, New York, on the Brooklyn Bridge with a, a group called Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street is a political movement in the United States. It works to raise awareness about economic inequality, corruption, and excess corporate influence on the government, especially when it comes to financial companies. On October 1st, 2010, Occupy Wall Street protesters were marching on the Brooklyn Bridge, and the New York Police Department cracked down on the marchers, arresting over 700 protesters. Among those arrested was a young individual by the name of Malcolm Harris, who happened to be very active on Twitter. Malcolm was charged with disorderly conduct, a very minor charge in the United States. But the government prosecutors did something very notable in Malcolm's case. They went to Twitter and requested detailed information about Malcolm's Twitter account. The government did not go to a judge and get a warrant to get access to the information. They just got a subpoena, which is a lesser legal instrument. It does not require a judge to sign off on it. The police asked Twitter, not just for Malcolm's tweets, but also for the IP addresses associated with Malcolm and all the IP addresses that he had logged into Twitter from. They asked for data in the time leading up to his arrest and even after his arrest. The subpoena even asked for information about Malcolm's Twitter followers and the people he was following. It was far more information than could ever be necessary to establish whether or not Malcolm was on a bridge in October. It was a fishing expedition, an attempt by the police to gain access to far more knowledge than was necessary to prosecute a crime in order to see if there was any other incriminating evidence that they could come across. The police were not merely interested in Malcolm's publicly available tweets, they were also interested in his location, specifically where he was when he had logged into Twitter and on different occasions, and the IP addresses combined with different information would paint a rough picture of his location over time. And this would indicate not only where he was, but often who he may have been with. The fact is that our communications are increasingly mobile. We're using the internet and accessing social networks and sending messages from portable devices like smartphones and tablets and laptops. And this creates extraordinary opportunities to access knowledge from almost anywhere, but it also has a troublesome collateral effect of creating a digital trail of our physical locations over time. And increasingly, government agents are seeking access to this digital trail. They want to know where you are and when you're there and who you're with. And while the law is dragging its feet about protecting this data, more and more devices are increasingly collecting this information and storing it indefinitely. In the United States, we have case after case like Malcolm Harris, where the government is seeking access to location data of suspects without going to a court and getting a warrant. And it's not just the United States. 
in countries all over the world. As mobile phones and tablets and laptops become increasingly prevalent, law enforcement agencies are turning to technologies that we use every day, technologies like Twitter, like your mobile phone, to track our locations without our consent. What effect is this going to have on our society? Will people be less likely to engage in political protests if they're afraid that their cell phones are cre creating a record of their attendance? Or will people be more hesitant to attend certain meetings that are politically controversial? Could people be reluctant to go to religious functions, or to medical clinics, or to rehab clinics, or to a therapist, or a divorce counselor, knowing that the information that they were there will forever be contained in a mobile device, accessible by corporations, and potentially even the governments? These are questions we have to answer quickly, because increasingly portable electronic devices are permeating our daily lives. Location data isn't the only digital trail we need to be concerned with. Our lives and communications are increasingly moving online. We're sending out email messages with intimate information about our lives and our family, our relationships, our medical information, our business dealings, our clients, our plans for the future. And I'm not just talking about email. More and more people are entrusting communications to messaging services within social networking sites. And in many parts of the world, political activists are using email, Skype, and other messaging services to coordinate their efforts. And journalists are using these exact same tools to speak to their sources, even in endangered places. But these modes of communication, email and chat and messaging services, can often be intercepted. They can be copied and sent to the government, often without the sender or recipient even knowing. In January of 2011, the government of Tunisia launched a JavaScript injection attack in, resp in response to mass demonstration by the citizens of Tunisia, who had taken to the streets to protest unemployment and poor living conditions. Using this attack, the Tunisian government was able to capture the login information and passwords for many Tunisian activists who were logging into Google, Yahoo, and Facebook. The Tunisian government used these stolen credentials to log into the Tunisian activists' email and social networking accounts, presumably downloading all of their messages and then deleting the accounts entirely. Many of those who were attacked were arrested and interrogated. And Tunisia is far from the only government that is seeking access to private emails of citizens. After the attacks on September 11th, the United States government instituted a program to collect a copy of all the browsing and internet traffic going to and from AT&T. AT&T is the largest telecom provider in the United States. My organization, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, received whistleblower evidence from a former AT&T technician named Mark Klein. He provided us photographs, like this one, and schematics, and showed us that AT&T was cooperating with the government. They had installed a fiber optic splitter in a secret room in their facility in San Francisco, just down the street from my office. This splitter, this splitter created a copy of all of the emails, web browsing, and other internet traffic to and from AT&T customers. And then AT&T sent a copy of this data to the National Security Agency, a, an intelligence branch of the United States government. This copying was supposed to target international communications. For example, communications between people in the United States and Brazil. Um, but it didn't just include international communications, it included both domestic and international internet activity. Under the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution, individuals in the United States are supposed to be protected from, the gov from unreasonable search and seizure. This countrywide wiretap violates the American Constitution, and it violates the rights of American citizens. EFF, my organization, launched two lawsuits against this wiretap, one against the government for wiretapping people illegally, and one against AT&T for their role in assisting them. 
And I'm sad to say that AT&T is not the only company out there that is helping governments to warrantlessly wiretap individuals. Many companies, many of them based in the United States and Europe, are selling sophisticated technologies to governments all over the world. Companies like Gamma International and its subsidiary Finfisher, companies like Blue Coat, like Maris, like Trovacor. They are selling technologies can, that can be used to intercept messages, including emails and Skype messages, and that can infect the computers of activists and can log keystrokes. The documents of Gamma International and its subsidiary Finfisher that were found in the state security e building in Egypt showed how they had provided the Egyptian government with a five-month trial of their sophisticated spying technology, especially FinSpy, which can wiretap encrypted Skype phone calls and instant messages. The Wall Street Journal has since reported about how Finfisher works. It works sort of like the way online criminals steal banking and credit card information. Authorities can covertly install malicious malware onto a, computer's, onto a computer by tricking the user into downloading programs like iTunes and Adobe Flash. Once installed, they can see everything that the user can see. The FinFisher products can even remotely turn on a user's webcam or a microphone in a cell phone without the user ever being aware. In Bahrain, we saw just how dangerous such technologies can be in the wrong hands. There, human rights activists faced torture, were beaten and interrogated, and presented with copies of their private text messages. One individual, a school administrator and human rights activist, told reporters that his interrogators had transcripts of his text messages and details from his personal phone calls. They would torture him and question him, and if they were dissatisfied with his answers, they would put him back in his cell. The company that sold this technology to the Bahrain government was Siemens AG and maintained by Nokia Siemens Networks, a Western company. Maintaining privacy online. There can be life or death uh, for people in the wrong circumstances. But we must also concern ourselves with censorship regimes, places that block access to the certain content on the web, or maybe block access to the web at all. The most dramatic examples are places like Syria and Egypt, where during times of political turmoil, the internet was shut off entirely. But access to the web may be partially inhibited limiting access to the free and open web without entirely shutting it down. We see this, for example, in Ethiopia. Even though the Ethiopian constitution promises to uphold freedom of expression, the Ethiopian government has expended incredible effort to prevent the citizenry of that, company, of that country from accessing the internet. It starts by simply making it difficult to get online. Internet penetration in Ethiopia is among the lowest in all of sub-Saharan Africa. According to Open Net Initiative's 2009 report, the majority of internet access in the country occurs in internet cafes, most of which are in the capital city. These cafes provide slow and unreliable internet access. Eskandar Nega, who is a prominent Ethiopian blogger who has been imprisoned for his speech and is a, a personal hero of mine, has written that the, that the web censorship in Ethiopia has political motivation. He wrote in 2011, prior to his arrest, it is hard to sign in and out of a simple email window. Vast broadband ser service, internet access, gave birth to the North African Revolution. And now, the revolution-phobic Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front is struggling against fast internet access. But even Ethiopians who can get online often can't reach independent international news sites. The only telecommunication service provider for all of Ethiopia is the state-owned Ethiopian Telecommunications Corporation, which heavily censors access to the open internet. 
tests conducted by the OpenNet initiative in September 2012 uh, showed that online political and news sites are heavily blocked within the country. And even if you were able to get past all of these technical barriers, there are dangerous laws in place in Ethiopia that imprison bloggers who criticize the government. But censorship can be a lot more subtle than this, making it difficult for individuals in a country to access certain types of content online. We see a very good example of this uh, with China. Uh, in addition to extensive surveillance, the government in China uses technology sold to it by the American company Cisco to block access to certain content on the internet, either temporarily or forever, using techniques including blocking domain names or blocking whole IP addresses. Access to information that is critical of the Chinese government or provides unflattering evidence about the Chinese government, such as information about the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests, is frequently inaccessible from within China. Search terms for words like Egypt are blocked because they are afraid it will foment revolution. And social networks like Facebook and Twitter are inaccessible. Cisco readily admits to selling equipment to China, but continues to deny allegations that they customize that equipment to suit the unique needs of the Chinese government. We would think that the people in China would be upset about not being able to access uh, Facebook and Twitter and similar sites. But in China, the government has encouraged local alternatives to social networks, microblogging platforms and search engines. And those local alternatives then become mainstream because they are not blocked the way international alternatives are. And because there are so many good Chinese language websites that are visible and accessible from within China, there's less incentive for people to try to seek out these international sites like Twitter and Google. And then the, and then the Chinese government tasks these websites with reviewing the content on those sites to ensure that anything that is objectionable, either socially or politically or religiously, will be removed. This results in many websites in China having staff members whose only job it is to review content on their sites and remove things that may be controversial. And this is, in effect, the privatization of government censorship. It's easy to criticize the Chinese government and Cisco for engaging in this type of censorship, but there are many examples of countries all over the world that are censoring content because some people would consider it lewd or inflammatory, or because some have argued that that content violates somebody's copyright. Frank LaRue, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, has criticized copyright laws in France where an individual merely accused of violating copyright on multiple times can have their internet shut off. And in the United States, we saw legislation that was introduced that would have shut down whole websites if even one part of that website was accused of copyright infringement. I'm happy to say that that particular piece of legislation, SOPA and PIPA, we were able to defeat last year. But I have no doubt that they are going to try again, if not this year, then again very soon. When we look out at internet policies, both what the law says and data on what the government and companies are actually doing, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. The same technologies that people are supposed to be using to unite and empower individuals is being used for surveillance and censorship by companies working hand in hand with misguided governments. It's a serious problem. So what can we do? The solution to these regimes of censorship and surveillance will not happen easily or quickly. For every new piece of technology that we invent to push back against surveillance and censorship, powerful forces invent new ways to counter and undermine our work. The truth is that the internet is supposed to be a free and uncensored place where everybody can access information unrestrained. And the internet holds the promise of being the great repository of all of human knowledge. And more than that, it's home to our dreams and our humor, our faith, our art. It is not just a factual accounting of our lives that finds its place online, but the whole of human nature, its transcendent art, 
and its repulsive underbelly. I'm going to spend the rest of today talking about solutions. For much of my job, I talk about solutions that are regulatory and legislative. I'm fighting bad internet laws, and I'm promoting good ones. Um, and that's a slow and difficult process. And we've learned that when we all work together, we are able to stop the very worst things and try to make some laws a little bit better. But since so many people in this audience today are technically oriented, I wanted to talk about the incredible role that free software plays in combating internet surveillance and censorship. I'm going to talk about four tools that have, are available to us right now, what they do, what they need, and how you can get involved. These tools are generally built by volunteers, many of them who have never met one another, uh, working tireless hours, uh, even though it's not going to make them rich, and it's not going to make them famous, and it may not even get them any friends, uh, though sometimes it does. And so why do people do this? Uh, some people uh, do it because they needed the functionality that the tool provides anyway, and contributing to the code is an easy way to make sure that their projects run smoothly. But other times, it's like a challenge. They do it just because it's broken and they want to fix it. But often, people are contributing to these tools because they believe in the purpose behind the project. They believe that this piece of technology, whether it's large or small, ought to be able to work and ought to be available to people to allow them to communicate freely and privately online. I'm going to talk about a few types of the many different types of technology that are available to anyone who wants to use them. Uh, these are technologies that are free to use and free to people who know what they're doing to actually go in there and start tinkering with them and make them better. Uh, each of these tools is useful for safeguarding rights of internet users against abusive governments. And I'm going to urge you guys uh, to contribute however you can, both here at Campus Party, because we're going to be having a hackathon, and after you leave here, uh, when you go out into the real world, I'd like to urge you to do what you can to try to make a difference. And I'm going to start by talking about one of my favorite projects where a number of my good friends work, and that is Tor. Uh, Tor, or the Onion Router, was originally developed in the United States uh, to protect U.S. government communications. It was designed for the U.S. Navy, but now it's available for free to anyone who wants to use it. It's software that helps individuals mask their IP addresses by routing their traffic through a series of volunteer middlemen who lend computing resources to the larger Tor network. So think about this for a moment. Your IP address can indicate a lot about you. We saw that when we discussed Malcolm Harris a little bit earlier. It can generally say where you are in the world, and sometimes it can indicate almost exactly where you are. If I'm sitting at an internet cafe and a friend with a friend, and we're both working on computers, then someone surveilling my email or social networking accounts would be able to figure out generally where I was and sometimes they'd know exactly where I was. And given enough resources, they might be able to figure out who I was with. And this is exactly the type of data that authoritarian regimes are so hungry to get about activists and democratic protesters. So if we have somebody who maintains a controversial political blog in a place where it is dangerous to do so, uh, and this person logs into her blog from her home address, uh, the government might be able to figure out where she lives and might be able to set up surveillance on her entire household, uh, tracking the information of the sites that she visits and the sites that her family members are visiting and any usernames and potentially even passwords of what they're getting access to. But when activists use Tor, they have a new tool to defend themselves against this type of surveillance. Activists who use Tor can circumvent nationwide surveillance and censorship uh, of specific URLs that are being blocked from within a country. And they have a new layer of an anonymity as they blog and communicate with the world. Usage of Tor skyrocketed during the Arab Spring. But if you've ever used Tor, you'll know that it is slow and it's a little cumbersome. It's largely because Tor relies on volunteers to work, volunteers who are willing to run all of these Tor nodes. And there aren't enough volunteers to do it. There are two types of Tor nodes that I want to talk about. One is middle nodes, and one is exit nodes. A middle node is like one of these nodes in the middle with the green arrows. Uh, it allows traffic to hop through it and just gives a little bit of computing power to the Tor network. 
It's relatively risk-free, and it's easy to do for anybody who already has downloaded the Tor browser bundle from the Tor website. An exit node is a more complex issue, but it is extremely important to the health of the Tor network. If you run an exit node, then the IP address associated with it may be adopted by people routing their traffic through their node. Many of the people using this service will be trying to protect their privacy and circumvent censorship. But some people, sometimes, might use your, these Tor nodes to engage in activity that is immoral or illegal, which means that their activity might mistakenly be attributed to your IP address, which is why it's very important that if you want to contribute to the Tor node, to the Tor network, that you understand the risks and responsibilities of the different types of Tor nodes. And uh, so we have put together a legal guide to Tor, which is available on the EFF site and on the Tor site. And I would urge you guys to check it out. Running a middle node or an exit node is an easy way for a relatively tech-savvy person to give back to Tor. But if you're not at all tech-savvy, uh, you can actually pay somebody else to run a Tor node for you. Uh, these two companies, Noise Tor, which is based in San Francisco, and TorService.net, uh, will actually accept donations. And you can set up a monthly payment to them, and they will actually go out there and create Tor nodes for other people uh, to ensure that people all over the world are able to access this powerful anon anonymization tool. Um, another powerful and incredibly simple to use form of software that promotes online privacy and fights surveillance is off-the-record chat. And I am not talking about the Google service off-the-record chat, uh, which has a very similar name, but is definitely not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an add-on that works with Adium and Pigeon. Uh, online chatting is one of the easiest ways to communicate online with friends, but it leaves this data trail that can be sought and has been sought by governments and reviewed by corporations. And to protect messages from interception as they travel over the network, you need to use encryption. And off-the-record chat does that. When you and your friends use off-the-record chat, you have excellent protection for communications on the network. And you will prevent your message provider from storing the content of your communications. Even though they'll still have a record of who you were talking to, they don't know what you were saying. So if you're an activist and you're working to organize a public protest against the government, uh, and you want to talk to other people about your chat, about your plans, um, using services like Google and AIM will result in companies like Google and AOL getting a copy of all of your communications. Well, let's say an activist uses OTR. In that case, the only information that Google or AOL or another chat client is going to get is an encrypted stream of data, and they will not be able to read it. So even if Google or AOL or another chat provider receives an order from the government to turn over those chat communications, and even if they cave in and they hand all that data over, even then, your privacy is still protected because the data was encrypted in a way that they weren't able to access. Using OTR correctly will also prevent sophisticated spies from intercepting and changing your messages before they are delivered. And this is extremely useful for ensuring that you're actually talking to the person that you thought you were talking to. This tool, OTR, can be one of the best and safest ways that you can communicate online privately. But there are pretty major challenges to it. And the first is that simply too few people are actually, actually know about it or are using it. Everybody knows that you can chat on Facebook or through Google Talk. But almost nobody is using, relatively to that, ADM or Pigeon. And the second big project problem is that uh, many of these tools have security flaws in them. These are bugs that are allowing people to, uh, that need to get fixed um, to, to ensure that these tools cannot be broken into. Last year, we actually hired somebody to spend an entire summer just going through OTR and searching for security bugs. But we can't do this alone. We need people from the security community to step up and help us to ensure that these tools will be functional and available to everyone. Um, the next tool I wanted to talk about is HTTPS Everywhere. Is there anybody here who does not currently run HTTPS Everywhere on their computer? 
maybe a couple people. Like the other technologies I have been discussing, discussing HTTPS everywhere is free. Free as in free speech, as in uh, software libre. Uh, anyone can look at the code and see how it functions and contribute to improving it. Uh, there are generally two protocols to access the, accessing the web, HTTP and HTTPS. And HTTPS is the secure version. It means that the communications between your computer and the website or server you are accessing are securely encrypted. So that means that if you log into a website using HTTPS, then your password is being sent encrypted and securely to the server rather than passing in the clear. When data travels in the clear, it's possible for anyone monitoring the network, like someone sitting next to you in a computer cafe or your ISP or the government, to intercept that message. Um, and they'll be able to see the exact text of your communications, sometimes your passwords, your username, and exactly what page on the internet you are visiting. But when you use HTTPS, all of the data that you are sending is encrypted. It's gobbledygook. It doesn't make sense to other people. The person who is eavesdropping will be able to see what website you go to, but won't be able to see what page within that site you are seeing. And they aren't able to intercept your passwords or your username. HTTPS Everywhere is a browser add-on that you can install in literally just a couple of minutes. And it's created by EFF and the Tor project. And you can use it on Google Chrome or Firefox. And it's useful for journalists and whistleblowers and act activists. But honestly, it is useful for everybody who wants privacy and security online, which is why we already have 2.5 million users. To function well, HTTPS needs two things. It needs websites to actually enable HTTPS. And so if you run a website, I urge you, please, enable HTTPS on it. And it also needs volunteers to help us contribute code to the site. Our add-on isn't automated. It's not like it automatically switches every URL from HTTPS to HTTP to HTTPS. We actually require individual people to go through and contribute individual rules to the site. So if you're somewhat technically savvy, it doesn't take that much time to learn, please help us out by maintaining this site. And the easiest thing that you can do to support this technology is just download it and start using it and tell your friends about it. And if you see companies that aren't using HTTPS, then please contact them and tell them to offer a secure version of the site. There's no question that HTTPS everywhere, especially when combined with Tor, can actually save lives. I told you earlier about how the Tunisian government launched a JavaScript injection attack, and they were able to siphon off passwords and usernames of activists in that country. Individuals in that country who are using HTTPS everywhere to log on to Facebook and Google were protected, which means that those activists did not suffer from having their accounts uh, broken into and deleted. Those activists were safe. We need to get everybody using this technology so that this particular type of mass surveillance will be made impossible. Um, and the next one, and the last one I'm going to talk about, because I'm running out of time, uh, is another powerful tool called Tossback. And that is the subject of the hackathon that we are launching uh, here at Campus Party. Uh, Tossback is a powerful tool that we launched a few years ago at EFF. Uh, and it, it tracks terms of services on websites. So we're all used to this. When you log on to a website, uh, you often have to agree to terms of service the first times you use it. Or any time you visit a website, you can go down and see the terms of service. And these terms of service will will decide all sorts of things. Um, and for example, the terms of service will let you know uh, that if you've handed private messages to a company, whether or not uh, they will hand that data to the government immediately, or if they will require a warrant, or if they will give you a chance to protest it. Unfortunately, terms of service are difficult to understand, and they can change at any time. The promises a company makes when you first sign up for a service could be radically different two months or six months or 12 months later. How they treat your data, whether it's giving it to other businesses or governments or exposing it in ways that you weren't expecting, can be changed any day. And every day that internet users are using those services, they have no idea what's going on. There are a lot of policy proposals to deal with this, 
Um, but I'm going to talk about a technical one, which is tossback. Um, basically, it monitors the terms of services of a whole bunch of different websites. And uh, it creates a copy of them, and it stores it on our site. And we have an archive of all of the previous terms of service. So you can use this service to see what Facebook's privacy policy was in 2009, and in 2010, and in 2011, and in 2012. And it's open source, so anybody can contribute to it. Um, in fact, in Europe recently, a group launched a, a service called Terms of Service Didn't Read, which is actually building on this same database and allows you to uh, match and rate and analyze Terms of Service. I think Tossback and ToSDR are particularly important because the terms of service you agree to on a website are often completely ridiculous. For example, Facebook's rights and responsibilities make users promise not to provide any false information on Facebook. So lying about your age, your marital status, your birthday, or your name violates those terms. Uh, many users violate these terms without ever realizing it. For example, you violate uh, the terms of service of the website Pandora if you let a friend of yours log on to your account because the terms of service of Pandora say that you will not allow anyone else to use any aspect of your account information. The New York Times website has terms of service that you violate if you're accidentally impolite uh, when you're leaving comments on the uh, New York Times. And the, uh, the online dating site eHarmony has terms of service that prevent users from ever sending messages that are sexually oriented. These terms of service govern what we're able to do and say in online environments, but most people don't read them, and they don't understand them, and they have no idea when they change. So that's why we need tools like Tossback and ToSDR. But unfortunately, Tossback is not working right now. Uh, a lot of major websites have employed tricks to make it more difficult for us to scrape their terms of service. Uh, and I'm happy to say that Campus Party has agreed to help out the internet and to make the web a better place for everyone by hosting a hackathon here around Tossback. We're going to have the hackathon starting in the cross space area at 4.30. We're going to have a little meet and greet. And then we're going to meet there again at 10 PM. And that'll be an opportunity to actually get a, a lecture on how to contribute to Tossback. And if you're technically oriented and you have a few minutes to spare, and especially if you know Ruby, please please come find me, shoot me an email, let's meet in the cross space area, and let's talk about what we can do to relaunch this project so that everybody on the web can benefit from Tossback. Um, often when we're faced with extraordinary problems like surveillance and censorship and governments trampling on our online rights, it can be really easy to feel overwhelmed, uh, to feel like there are these huge, powerful forces that are preventing us from uh, accessing the open web and speaking privately. Uh, but what I have learned over time is that when people are willing to come together and collaborate with their technical skills, they can push back against even the strongest of adversaries. We can create amazing tools that can change the world. We have already started to build a movement of people who care deeply about the future of the internet and be deeply about the future of free speech on the internet. Uh, and part of that is creating these tools and technologies that will push back against censorship and surveillance. If you're intrigued by this talk and want to try out some of the technology I mentioned, then I urge you to download it and try it out. Uh, tell your friends about it, blog about it, translate it into another language, get your hands dirty, experiment, be willing to embrace failure. This is how we built the internet, and this is how we can help maintain the values of freedom and openness in the future. Um, I wanted to end uh, with a comment from uh, Carl Malamud. Last week, I went to the memorial service of Aaron Schwartz, who was a colleague of mine who had worked to help defeat SOPA. And Carl, who's a personal uh, hero of mine, came and he spoke out about the work we are doing to bring knowledge to the internet, uh, to bring access to knowledge to the world. And I wanted to share some of these words with you because I was deeply moved by them and because they serve to remind me of why we do this important work. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with these words. And uh, 
If you have questions, you can email me, and you can also meet me in the cross space area either at 4.30 or then tonight at 10. Carl said, our army, army of digital rights advocates, isn't one lone wolf. It is thousands of citizens, many of you in this room, who are fighting for justice and knowledge. I say we are an army, and I use the word with cause because we face people who want to imprison us for downloading a database to take a closer look. We face people who believe that they can tell us what we can read and what we can say. But when I see our army, I see one that creates instead of destroys. When I see our army, I see an army that creates new opportunities for the poor, an army that makes society more just and more fair, an army that makes knowledge universal. When I see our army, I see the people who created Wikipedia and the Internet Archive, the people who coded GNU and Apache and Bind and Linux. I see the people who made the EFF and the Creative Commons. I see the people who created our Internet as a gift to the world. Thank you. I think we're too low on time for. No, I have time for questions. Don't worry. No, I have time for questions. That's fine. Don't worry. All right, okay. How's it going? Pessoal, a gente tem tempo para perguntas aqui. Eu não sei se tem algum voluntário com a microfone aqui não. Que Deus voluntários microfone. É, você pode fazer a pergunta em inglês ou em português, tá certo? Se fizer em inglês, se fizer em português, por favor, falando no microfone para que a, a tradutora possa traduzir, tá? É, tem um voluntário aqui, ó, levanta a mão que ele vai passar, tá certo? Olá, Rainy. É, o que hoje, na verdade, no Brasil hoje tem um retrato é, muito forte é, sobre a questão da neutralidade na rede. Uh, eu estive vendo uma palestra em dezembro na Far Limes com o senhor Sérgio Amadeu, do Comitê Gestor de Internet no Brasil. E a grande preocupação é dessa neutralidade da rede. E hoje no Brasil sabemos que a Copa de 2014, temos as Olimpíadas e, na verdade, os olhos estão no Brasil. O que nós aqui brasileiros hoje devemos fazer uh, para tentar combater isso, tentar mudar? O que vocês, americanos lá de fora, pensam aqui do Brasil? É uma mal ajuda, né? Se é no caso. That's a really good question. Um, and I'm not going to have all the answers. But I would say that one thing that happens uh, right before major sporting events like the Olympics or the World Cup is they try to put in place really huge surveillance technologies. And it's important that what happens in Brazil is not that you end up with a surveillance state, which can happen and does happen. So it's very important that you guys have an open debate about what kind of surveillance, public surveillance, you're going to allow, and whether or not uh, those pieces of surveillance will be in place after major sporting events. I would also say that right now, uh, in Brazil, you have a lot of legislation that is being considered, stuff like Marco Civil, Internet users who care about privacy and free speech and web freedom need to be involved in those policy discussions. You guys need to have something like the EFF here in Brazil. And what EFF does is we coordinate with groups that are based all over the world. So I've got people I work with in uh, South Korea. I've got people I work with in France. I need more people to work with here in Brazil who can tell me about uh, major fights and let us know how we can be most effective in supporting you guys. That at the end of the day, Brazilians have to fight for freedom in Brazil. And you guys need to have something like an Electronic Frontier Foundation here in Brazil. Olá, boa tarde. Uh... A F, a W3C, possui hoje uma API de geolocalização que permite localizar praticamente qualquer dispositivo, mesmo sem uso de GPS, cruzando informações como redes Wi-Fi, RFID e outras. É, é... Oh, wait, this wasn't on. Can you start again? Oh, yes. Uh, a W3C possui uma API de geolocalização 
que permite localizar dispositivos cruzando informações como é, endereços de é, é, redes sem fio disponíveis, é, endereços IPs, como foi discutido aqui, torres de celular e etc. Ah, vocês já identificaram algum uso não apropriado dessa tecnologia ou de outra tecnologia similar e existe alguma maneira de se proteger disso? So, this one was dead, and so I only caught part of your question. So I'm going to ask if I got the question right. Were, were you trying to say that... Can you help me with this question? Yeah, so basically what he's asking is that the WGC has this technology that allows you to identify connections from cell phone towers and, and available networks around uh, you and everything like that. And uh, if, if you know uh, if there are uh, this technology being badly used, Uh, and what can we do to protect ourselves? So, if he's asking about technology that is being used to identify? Yes, to, to pinpoint location. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so on cell phones, that's what he's asking about? Okay. Yeah, he, he, he and why? He said the WGC has, has standards for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I think I got your question now. <laughs> uh, and it seems like you're concerned about. Uh, how governments are, are, using, are tracking locations by triangulation through cell phones and Wi-Fi networks. And I would just say that one easy thing we can do, well, a couple different things. One, it needs to be possible for people to change the identifiers on their cell phones, and that should never be illegal. Uh, and two, we need to make sure that there's open Wi-Fi available to everyone. One of the things that happens is uh, people, uh, a, a, a Wi-Fi network becomes uh, associated with a particular person, but if everybody's Wi-Fi was open, then it would never be associated with one particular pe person because lots of people would use it. That's actually a very long-term solution. We're totally not there yet. Um, I think that, again, one of the major things that has to happen is when we're developing standards and we're trying to create a process for, uh, that's going to have an impact on the web, it's important that people that are concerned about privacy and concerned about free speech are the ones involved in that conversation. So to the extent that we're creating standards around privacy of uh, our location, it's important that we get people out there trying to innovate in that space. I'm not sure that was a great answer, so we can also talk afterwards. Are we wrapping up? One more question. I think this is the last question. Hi. And let me, wait, let me do this thing. Yes. É, primeiro, boa tarde. Estou gostando muito dessa palestra, está me informando bastante coisa. E assim, eu acredito, aqui no Brasil dá para a gente ver que tem muita monitoração, só que é muito mascarado isso. Será que não, uh -huh. se, não seria melhor tipo, a gente saber disso, que nem nos outros países, as pessoas sabem, tem como se defender, ou seria melhor essa coisa mascarada, que quase ninguém sabe e ninguém faz nada por isso? There is no question that it is so much better to have surveillance out in public. For years, people in the United States had no idea how much surveillance was happening there. And even now, most people don't even realize it. The, the, before you can reform something, you have to know about it. Anything you can do to push forward through policy and law and through uh, just investigative journalism that can get insight into how Brazil is surveilling either individual people on the street or people using the internet, that's so important for people to know about. I agree with you completely. We've got to start with public transparency about uh, surveillance. So extremely good point. That's uh, very valuable. And um, I'm, I think, am I out of time? They, I think I'm out of time. One more question? One more question. Okay, one more question. And then, again, I will be available at the cross space area at, at 4.30 and 10.30. And I don't know. There's also this woman here who's waving her hand so excitedly. <laughs> Wait, let me do this. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, the thing I would like to ask is that um, you're talking yes, about surveillance. Uh, you're talking about surveillance and all this, 
but the fact is not only to change, I, I think, do you think actually there is a change of uh, not only the, the human relation, the, the public, the, the, the political action, the, the, the market orientation, like, do you think it's, it's like a, we're not only getting together for a new internet, but for new ways of, uh, you know, living the life and having uh, the, you know, like changing the history. Like. Interesting. Um, I think that one of the things we're seeing right now is that everything we do and say that involves electronic devices is leaving this big data trail, right? So. It, it creates this sense of being watched in our daily activities. And I do think that that can have actually both positive and negative effects. So for example, a lot of people like to use little devices that will track how often they exercise and what they eat, and it will transmit that data and it helps them stay on their diets. I haven't found this to be very effective, but whatever. Um, a lot of people really like that. And a lot of people really like sharing their photos with all of their friends on Facebook and letting people know about it. And I think that that speaks to the fact that human beings have this fundamental need to communicate with one another, this fundamental need to connect. And that's what the internet is supposed to allow us to do. But the problem is that corporations have found ways to make money off of that sort of thing. They found ways to... Uh, Sometimes it, it, it makes them more money to change the, the privacy terms in ways that people aren't expecting or don't even want. And that can have unintended consequences. And then unfortunately what we're seeing again and again is that governments are uh, taking advantage of this oversharing. So I don't think that uh, in general oversharing and data trails have to be bad. I just think that people need to know about them and we need to have a real public discussion about what we're comfortable with and how we can move forward. Or else, what's going to happen is we're going to move forward into the future with, uh, with no real privacy or no rights for individuals and uh, we're going to lose these things that we care about so much, like privacy and free speech. So that's a really good question. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Pessoal, essa discussão é uma discussão importante. Eu sugiro que, se você ainda tem perguntas, procure a Rainy. Ela vai estar, aqui, vai estar aqui no evento ainda nos próximos dias. Tá certo? Ela vai ter uma palestra já tarde, como ela já falou. Tá? E vamos levar essa discussão mais para frente. Lembrando todo mundo que hoje à tarde, o Nolan, fundador da Atari, vai estar aqui no palco principal às 7 horas. E a todo mundo não esquecer de devolver o aparelhinho...